with you. All right, welcome to another debacle here on Saturday night at the Lennox <laughs> Saloon. We've all had a bit of, to drink. Um, Nate is uh, doing obligations tonight, so this is going to be different. It's been a little bit of a challenge getting here um, <laughs> tonight. Eric, uh, you've been great. Thank you for your help. Uh, appreciate it. Um, so, um, I'm lost. No. Uh, let's see. We want to look at, I don't even have the notes for tonight up. There we go. So. I just shared them. Uh, welcome to the Linux Saloon, a place to discuss tech, open source, and where Linux is always on tap. Uh, each show will have a talk about a Linux project, generally a Linux distribution, but it could be centered around a desktop environment or an application. Anything that is Linux tech and open source related is on table for discussions. So how is everyone tonight? Excellent. Good. Thank you for you joining. Still? Thank you for putting up with a little bit of last minute stuff. Uh, Anna Rita in the chat, can you hear me? It reminds me of two, year 2000 with MSN Instant <laughs> Messenger or Verizon. Uh, tonight, we're going to be talking about Shotwell, but I think we'll just start off with a general. Has any been, anybody been doing anything Linuxy or in tech this week? I decided to upload and download the newest version of the Raspberry Pi software of the operating system. They switched over to 64 bit finally. Uh huh. Uh, one of the things I noticed is, is if you go into the Chrome uh, uh, web browser and type in what, you know, what web browser I'm running, it'll tell you that you're running on Chrome OS. Interesting. Yeah, it is interesting. Uh, it's a lot stampier and a lot quicker and a lot faster than it was in the past. Uh, I was, I used it as a desktop probably for about an hour. Maybe actually more than that, right? Two hours. I was, you know, just doing simple web stuff, you know, and it was working a lot quicker than usual. And I'm like, why is this whole thing so much faster? And for some reason, I decided to see what it was running. And it says Chrome OS. And I'm, I was wondering if you guys thought that that would be a, uh, a faster uh, <laughs> Chrome than regular Chrome, because it is. And <laughs> I, I don't, I never thought it would be. Which, uh, which model of Pi are you running? Uh, Raspberry Pi 4 with 4 gigs of RAM. Oh, wow. Okay. It's a 64-bit operating system, and evidently it's running the Chrome OS version of, of Chrome, which I never thought would be faster. I, I, I hmm. was confused by that, but I guess maybe it's because it has better features built into it, like, say, to watch Netflix or some, you know, some stuff like that. I don't know. I, I just thought I'd just bring it out there because I thought you guys might be curious about it. Yeah, that's interesting. I, I'm almost wondering if it's like a user agent thing because, I mean, it's not... Chrome OS, it's <clears throat> right. Um, That's what I was thinking too. Yeah, so I'm not sure, and maybe using that user agent does uh, translate to faster performance. I, I honestly <laughs> completely <laughs> yeah, unprepared. I, <laughs> no, I'm yeah, I'm completely lost with it too. I was very confused by it. I was like, going, why is it coming up Chrome OS? It never did before. Yeah, that I remember because I have checked in the past. Oh well, I just thought it was interesting. Well, it's great to see that you could actually use it. Um, I mean, I know the Pi 4, and especially with four gigs of RAM, um, I mean, that should make it something that you could actually use, not something you'd probably want to use on a regular basis, but at least would be capable of doing light browsing. And I don't know, did you try a bunch of different things? You said you used it for a couple hours. I mean, what Oh, yeah, I, I watched Netflix on it. I, uh, what else? I watched YouTube on it. Uh, I. Uh, let's see, what else did I do? I checked my email and I have to say in, um, when I logged into my Gmail account, it came in and said, somebody logged in with your account in a Chrome OS operating system. It said it there also. Uh, huh. Also the fact that is usually I used to switch the um, uh, Gmail over to the older version because it ran so slow in the newer one for some reason in the Chrome OS, you know, the Chrome OS in the past, or I'm, I'm sorry, in the Raspberry Pi OS in the past. But this time it ran silky smooth. I had no issues. Um, what else did I do on it? Oh, I played with my little programs that I usually try out, you know, simple stuff just to see if they work. And no, uh, it was pretty snappy, I would say. They made a lot of better improvements for it. They made it easier to update uh, the firmware in it. Um, they have an update icon in the top uh, 
right, if that tells you that there's updates to install, those were the two features that I noticed the most that changed off right off the bat. I ran ZRAM in it, I put installed ZRAM, and then I installed um, Pi Commander to overclock it. Um, if you go look up that processor and find where it's sold in other devices, it was it's it usually runs faster than what uh, the Raspberry Pi came at originally um, because evidently they had a problem with the firmware and they don't know if you're going to run a heat sink and they don't know if you're going to run a fan. So if you're running a heat sink and a fan, you can really overclock the thing without hurting it. It's not like I'm doing something like to a PC where they kind of know what you're going to run. Now I bored you to tears. <laughs> No, not at all. That's actually an interesting scenario. I never even thought about needing to account for whether there was cooling available or not and being right. able to you know, change clock speeds and stuff like that. So I, I have a, a Pi 2 that I use as a, as a Pi hole system. Right. And that, that's it. That's all I've ever really done with, with Raspberry Pi. And they're so much more capable now that, that the two that I have is very, very modest in terms of what it's capable of doing. Uh, it works. It's just really slow to do right. even anything. It's just super slow. Um, I remember <clears throat> using the desktop maybe once or twice just to kind of see what it looked like. And this was, you know, several years ago. And yeah, it was it was not something you could have used. Um, so I imagine that a Pi 4 would be much, much better in terms of just basic, like you're saying, just general usage. I mean, I, I'm sure you really couldn't do much. Um, you know, in terms of like re re-encoding something or you know, that kind of stuff. But, yeah, uh, yeah. <clears throat> but you can check your email, watch a YouTube video, surf the web and read, you know, user group forum stuff. I mean, there's a lot you could do with it. I mean, I, you know, setting it up behind your television set to be able to flip it over just to check your email, mm. you know what I mean, would be actually really a, a, a fine user experience with it and it wouldn't suck a lot of power. It doesn't make any noise. Yeah. You could leave it on probably what? all the time without not even caring about Could it. Could you pull them out? And imagine things like that. You need? Thanks, imagine buddy. even if you did get one of those cases with a fan that if it was like behind something, you probably wouldn't be able to hear it unless it was like a high pitch or something. Oh, but I got it sitting like two feet from me and I can't hear it. Well, maybe I'm deaf, but. <laughs> yeah, I have a fan on a Pi 4 and I, I ended up disconnecting it because it was just the most incessant whining noise. <laughs> maybe I'm just, maybe I haven't no. quite hit old enough to not hear it, but yeah, it, it was <laughs> right. awful. Yeah, I've had systems too with those, especially those tiny, tiny little fans. And yeah, the, the frequency that they... Like the old Northbridge fans that you get oh, on motherboard? They're just, yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly. And it is. It's just like, unless you had a completely soundproof case, it was so loud. Yeah, and I guess if you aren't stressing the system, I don't know that you absolutely need to have it. No, uh, you don't. I got a little program that I run to check the temps and they're fine. They're safe. Gotcha. So who's got anything else? Who did what? I, uh... I took... I think Sorry, Ad, no, Adam, ahead, Adam, you didn't Dan. do anything. You... I didn't do anything. Go ahead, Dan. No. I, I took a look at a new distro that came out by uh, Matthew Moore and Cobalt Rogue called Titan OS. It's themed around Greek mythology, and it features KDE as a desktop, and it's Debian-based. It's extremely lightweight. If you're somebody that struggles with KDE or wants to explore KDE for the first time, this is an excellent distro to do it with. They don't, uh, um, like Peppermint, they don't fill it full of stuff. You know, they let you install what you want. And then it has a few tools in it to help you with some issues, but it's a really nice OS and they have it themed really well. If you want to look at it, you can get a copy at it at SourceForge. Just search for Titan Linux. Yeah, I ran into Matthew for a few minutes last night on uh, Toss. He had a, a little bit of a private stream. I couldn't stay on long. He was talking about it. So, yeah, something different. But, uh, yeah, Adam, I was sorry. I was messing with you. you, you um, no, you've been really getting into it this week, haven't you? Man, it's been an adventure. Put it that way. Uh, so... I dove into the wonderful world of what I referred to as VFIO, or I think it's Virtual Function Input Output is what it stands for. Could be wrong, but I think that's right. Um, and it's basically passing in like PCI Express and other devices into your virtual machines, um, usually used for things like graphics cards and such to play games on Windows, but still have a Linux base. So I have a, uh, 
I have a desktop here that's basically become a server, but I was like, you know, I kind of want like an I have a I have this laptop that doesn't really play super well with Linux. Um and you know, most of the time I feel like I'm on Windows on it anyway. Uh so I was like, you know what, here's here's how I can get the best of both worlds, right? And so I have enough I have like 32 gig of RAM in the machine, so there's plenty of RAM to throw around. It's a six core 12 thread CPU, so not super high end, but enough. Um, and I was, you know, I just started looking into it. And after a couple of days of doing this, I finally have some success. Um, so basically I have uh, a VM in using uh, Vert Manager, you know, libvertd, uh, which is using KVM for the back end. And I have the Windows machine running in that uh, virtual machine. But I also configured some kernel flags, some boot flags and other things to enable and a BIOS flag to enable um, what's called an IO MMU. And that allows it to sort of segment off each device on your PCI Express buses. And I had to run a separate kernel. I, I chose the Liquorix kernel. I'm sure you guys have heard of that one. Um, and that one has a patch called ACS that further segments each device into its own IO MMU. So each group might contain uh, multiple devices. So for example, my group one contained my GPU, but it also contained like my motherboard's PCI Express controller and stuff. Well, when you pass in devices to a VM, you have to pass everything in that group. So I didn't want to pass in the PCI Express bus because when you pass it in, you're basically redirecting it from your host to the VM. So the driver that gets loaded by Linux is a vert IO driver, basically. Um, it's like a PCI VFIO driver that does nothing for the Linux host, but is useful for KVM to pass that functionality onto a VM. So you don't want to pass all of that because then your machine really wouldn't function, right? Because if it needs its own PCI Express, you know, bus drivers. So the ACS patch in the kernel allows me to segment each of them off into its own device. So instead of all those in one, number one is just my GPU. Number two is just my capture card. Number three is a USB controller, those kind of things. So I segmented those off and then through some configuration and vert manager and such, uh, added in the PCI Express devices into the configuration for the VM and then install Windows just like normal. So you have to have some extra hardware for this. You have to have two different keyboards and mice. There are ways to do it in one set, but it's it's more than I wanted to bother with. I have the hardware, so why not? So I have two different keyboards and mice. One of them is one of those like Logitech like keyboard trackpad combos, and the other is an actual like legit keyboard and mouse. And in the process, I pass through one of the two USB controllers on my motherboard. So there's one that's like the Intel USB controller, and then there's a third party AS Media one that controls a couple other ports. And so I just pass the Intel one into the VM and the others exist for Linux. So my Linux keyboard and mouse are plugged into the third party controller and the rest of the stuff that's plugged into the Intel controller actually goes directly into Windows. And when you do the installation of Windows and all that, you install drivers just like normal, like you normally would on Windows, you know, go to NVIDIA site or, you know, Razer's site or whoever makes your stuff. And it Windows is almost like it has no idea that it's a VM in some way. Some, some places it might, but most of the time it has no idea it's a VM um, if you configure it properly. And so, you know, what, what I, what I end up with is on my right monitor, I have windows on my left monitor, I have Linux and the monitor on the right is actually plugged into the GPU itself, which is what is output by the VM. So it's, it's kind of weird. Cause it feels like, a, like just a windows box. Like it, it performs just like a windows box, but it's a VM on my Ubuntu machine. And the cool thing is, is it's not limited to Windows. So I uh, saw that there was a new Arch installer. So I shut down my Windows VM and created an Arch Linux VM. And it passed through the GPU and the USB and all that. And it's just like running, it feels just like running Linux on native hardware, but it's actually, a, but I have the convenience of a VM. So I don't have to deal with dual booting. I don't have to deal with having a bunch of hard drives. They're really just VMs, but they perform like regular hardware. It's quite awesome. You know, it's been great um, the last couple of days. Uh, I can, it's, we do a little bit of private chatting between uh, Eric and Adam and um, 
Who's that other guy down in Australia there? Uh, Colin? And no, um, one. Yeah. no one of any of importance. Uh, mm-hmm. One of those foreigners. Uh, but the excitement that uh, you've been posting is, is, is awesome. So thanks for uh, sharing that. It's, it's cool when, when, when one is having fun. Um, yeah, it's pretty awesome. And it, like, it'll play games and stuff, just like full performance you know, video, like games play just like they would on normal hardware. I was playing now, granted the GPU that I have in here is not very new. It's a GTX 970. So it's, you know, 2015, 2014 GPU, but I was playing overwatch at like 112 frames a second. So I'm just saying that's pretty good for a VM, right? <laughs> that's really good. Yeah. yeah. Cause all I did this week was uh, try out unity, uh, uh, Ubuntu unity. Not like last week where I did a bunch of stuff. Yeah, and they did a crash course in uh, uh, adding a OBS scene to OBS, <laughs> but it all worked out. Rick, you had some uh, stuff on your stream this week. Uh, you were testing. You did two t- a test this week, and then you did a, a stream. Yeah, I had a Ubuntu uh, Unity on my stream this past Wednesday, and I also put out a video today about my pie. Oh, it's Pie Day. <laughs> yeah raspberry pi 400 i Got prefer blueberry you know. <laughs> steve's making bad jokes continue <laughs> yeah. michael so can't got, be the only one i got pi so that way i can test out arm distros and stuff more excellent so uh yeah you he, he, he was doing a test he was he was trying to get away from ndi and he used uh, uh zoom um, I do think you should really check out, uh, Adam was great in telling me about it. Teleport is awesome for OBS. It will really, it, it will really make it easier on your streaming and that. And it does, you can get it to work in the snap and you can get it to work in the flat back. You just have what to the, know where to put it in. I actually saw that and I wasn't sure. I, I looked at the the GitHub page. What What is it that makes it? more convenient or easier to um, deal with one it's not proprietary so ndi is proprietary <laughs> yeah. um setting up the sound is not hard on mdi it's a, just it's not a challenge but it's you know it's a, a, a couple extra steps that maybe one doesn't need to take teleport so you add uh the the uh teleport uh, um plug into its folder it shows up you select your and name your 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 desktop, your laptop, or whatever, and you're able to pick up different instances. So it's already capturing when you got OBS up. It's capturing the screen. It's screen capturing, and you don't have to do anything extra to get sound out of it. If you are playing a video, say I got it on my laptop down here, but I have it captured in Teleport in Zoom. I, I'm sorry, not Zoom and OBS. The sound is immediate. It, it creates a, 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 a in the audio mixer a sound, and yeah. there's nothing that you have to do to set it up. Cool. And I know the the magic of NDI is that it's pretty much completely no latency um, over a network, which has always been really impressive to me. But so I assume that this yeah, is yeah. So um, actually, so if I use NDI and uh, I have it on Wi-Fi now, if I'm this close, so my my router is like that far away from here right now. I don't right. have to pay have it plugged into Ethernet. But if I left it downstairs and turned on NDI downstairs and came up here and it was on Wi-Fi, especially with the way my signal goes down there, there is a lot of latency. Now, I never tried it with Teleport, but uh, Teleport was <laughs> is just an easy setup. Um, then you add um, a, a screen scene on OBS t- uh, and capturing Teleport and you select. So I have three different, so on my stream, I have three different now uh, I, I just named them teleport one, two, and three. And if I'm showing a a, 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 um, a a distro in that, I throw OBS on it, throw in the teleport thing, and just say the Asus laptop or the HP 820, whatever, you know, 8840, 8440 or something like that. And then I could pick that out on each of those things and I could switch over with no problem. Neat. So it was, uh, check that, it out. yeah. Okay. Um, uh, it, it was it was really sweet um and thank you adam for that um no problem colin morning uh yeah uh, let's see you your last uh video was on sorry i i i saw it i was it was the um 
the uh, what was it called? Wow, it was really left of impression on you too, didn't it? Wow. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> Are you got a cold there, bud? I got something. I don't know uh, what it is. Just call it a cold. We're fine. I'll, I'll let you know. I'll get back to you. <laughs> I'm always teasing him about, uh, you know, uh, did he make a video this week? And they're like four or five of them out. Um, anything else in Linuxy this week? Not really. <clears throat> I I installed uh, Ubuntu 22.04 when it came out. And predictably, it's just easy and <laughs> everything works. Yeah. So um, I actually, so when I installed Ubuntu Unity, I, I actually, I normally don't do this. I left it Ubuntu 22.04 and I dual booted on the Asus laptop. So I, I've left it on there and, you know, uh, just because I haven't really installed on a, you know, did a dual boot in a while and uh, Unity, you know, uh, did it pretty good. Our main discussion today uh, is going to be about the... Um, Shotwell. Shotwell. See, I'm not, <clears throat> I'm not the only one. <laughs> well, dude, you're not 65 and <clears throat> an old timer's moment, so <laughs> excuse me. I just looked at it, you know, or I, I looked at it, I've used it before um and i'm interested to see you know not a lot of us do photography right um so it might not be useful um eris you can tell us can you tell us about your poll what kind of results you got <laughs> okay we'll come back to eris eris whenever you're ready just let me know i do do some photography i haven't done for anything really in a while um if for organization or i think downloading uh i know our our lovely wendy is always touting the um the one downloader um for photos and that which does work really nice but this organizes pretty well it's slightly you know it, it doesn't have a lot of function to it it can do editing it can do cropping um i had to i started with the deb and i couldn't get the sharing so you can share at least uh, i know at least three uh sites i think you can do facebook i think you can do liquor and um i can't remember the third uh i don't know if you could add more to it oh, Eris says his audio is not working wow i don't feel so bad now um <laughs> but um i then de uh, uninstalled the deb and i installed the flat pack which was a slightly newer version and it worked really well because i oh i couldn't get it to share it wasn't picking out sharing the flat pack did so you just have to do a password and all that. So um, it would be nice. I don't know if you can add it to it. I know you can make, there's uh, on the uh, on the GNOME site for that, the Wookiee, the Wiki, the Wookiee. Star Wars is <laughs> on my mind. I saw the, I saw the uh, trailer for Obi-Wan. It's like, oh, yeah. But anyway, um, so um, y if you're capable, you can make your own plugins for it, which would be pretty nice. So, uh, uh the, the flat pack worked better. I didn't try to upload anything, but it, it worked. It organizes all your photos uh, really quick. Um, looks for all your stuff. Again, I'm, I'm just interested, if you're not a photographer, would you use this? Or, and then each of you, if you, if you tried it and what you did with it. Now, Eric don't have no audio. <laughs> no, sorry, I'm talking to someone else. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Um, I've been checking out Shotwell. Um, I don't know if anyone ha else had the problem. I, I, I selected my pictures folder as default, but I had to add every individual folder or use Control Shift to add them all in. I thought it would have just picked up the pictures folder, but my folder is mounted, so I don't know if that makes a difference or not. Um, which mm. or my, my partition's mounted, but I thought you could have just chosen the pictures folder and they all came in, but Oh, that wasn't the case, but uh, I like the way it's got ratings on there. So you can actually select certain photos and rate them and they come up and you can choose them as a rating, which is really handy if you're working on a project or whatever, you could rate pictures and just um, sort them out and look for them and rate them and it makes it easier to find where those pictures are. So I found that really, uh, really interesting that and maybe somebody else has found some other things within that. I found the metadata most useful that the pictures that I imported into it because I knew about what time I took the pictures, but not year. I was like a year or two off and stuff and it pick up the, meta, the metadata and I'm like, 
wow, I, I took that picture then. Whoa. You know, were you surprised at how much metadata it captured or, or yeah, were you I was, surprised at how much your photo, your, your, your camera captures on metadata? Yeah, kind of, it kind of, you know, I didn't know my camera I was using at that time because it was th those, I mean, we're talking like 2010 and maybe even earlier than that. We're talking about before they really got cameras popular and phones and, um, you know, and, and uh, I think at that time I had like a, a sure shot camera, my little pocket jobs. And yeah, it put uh, the metadata in it for camera that old of the date and it was taken and uh, the uh, resolution size. And it kind of just blew me away on some of the pictures, like, because I had totally misplaced them as when I took them. And then I re realized when I met certain people in my life, because there's, there's family members that have come and gone out of my life and then come back and, you know, this is how they put all the dates together when I seen these people. Yeah, I know I'm, I am horrible when come to organize. I mean, I try to um, put things in the month and the year so I can find them. Mm -hmm. um, but it would, yeah, something like that is pretty, especially if you're, I mean, you do take a lot of pictures and you don't realize it. I mean, I, I, I do have one issue though. Um, I had a lot of photos from, a, oh, I, I hit, my first digital camera was a, I think a one megabyte Kodak something. I can't remember the name of it. I was so proud to get, or it was three megapixel. It was a three megapixel. And I took a lot of pictures with it and it was a good little camera. Um, so I had to go back and go uh, approximate what kind of year that was that when I, um, you know, took the pictures and all that. But, you know, more modern photos, uh, cameras and more modern, you know, the, the, uh, um, smartphones and all that could, could be a lifesaver going you know when when did you take that picture and if you're horrible like me organizing it this stuff can organize really well yeah this can this camera is a canon power shot and when you put the battery in it mm -hmm. it wants you to put the time and date and everything else in as part of the setup before you continue to take pictures or you can just hit the menu button and skip it all I, th I think of these type of uh, applications and I, you know, when I had digital cameras, um, did you think about it? Like you went, we went from film cameras to, you know, late nineties, early two thousands, digital cameras. And I had a little one that I would just carry around with me. And this is prior to smartphones. Tiny and thing. So, I mean, you old flip phones, you could take pictures, but they were generally pretty terrible. So it was always <laughs> mm -hmm. worth having a small camera with you. And I had one of the little Canon uh, Elf or whatever they were. And it was a great, you know, I had probably three of them over, you know, 10 years. Um, and yeah, um, deliberate about how you were organizing them and stuff like that. If you even if you just dump them into a folder, you still had to go through all the process of like getting them off of a card and all that. For better, for worse, since I've had a smartphone and I've always, not always, but pretty much always had Android, um, you know, smartphones is more or less sort of handle all of this stuff. So I mean, it's really interesting to, to use something like Shotwell because I still have a huge photo, you know, library, but <coughs> excuse me. Um, you know, I just, I guess I, I don't find the need for it nearly as much as I, as I used to. Um, My habit was, is, is when I wanted to actually empty out the device into the computer, I would just make a folder in the pictures, um, folder with the just the, the 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 date i emptied the camera but the photos that were in the camera could be over a year and a half old yeah and i i used to for a while um i was pretty good about folders with i would usually do like uh summer you know 2005 and then all of the pictures from that season would go into that folder mm -hmm um you know winter 2005 so i kind of had folders that were sort of blocks of time like that the problem is if you're not diligent like you said you know you end up finding an sd card with you know 100 pictures on it from three or four years ago and you're like oh you know now i'm going to go back and take the time to really organize these and um, at some point i just sort of stopped 
being diligent. I, I found it. for 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 most of it, uh, people don't really like to look at your photos. You're the only one that really enjoys them, unless you have some family members that can enjoy them with you that like them. Otherwise, you're the you're the person that looks at them the most. Yeah. After I think after we kind of discuss, um, Shotwell, I want to I want to ask a question about what you guys do with your photos. In the meantime, Eris, go else um, uh, was doing some shot well or well, have a I've need for a well program like past. that. I'm sorry, what? Right? I've done shot well in the past. Basically, I've used it for my server and I had pictures on the server. So I have it like I can install any computer in here and direct to direct to the pitch direct. And for some reason, mine imports all the files and folders over 6,000 pictures. So yeah, so I have that, and then and then what I what I use it for, but primarily is to run the slideshow on it. Uh, do you do you do you just use the import in place option? I can't remember which one I used this last time. I did did it just the other day when I set up my set it up out there in the our living room computer. Because that would be handy if it's on a server or if you have like I have a laptop with no re extra removable. Or interchangeable storage so i have everything on external ssds so i just hit you know add in place so that way every time i plug in that ssd then it will access that yeah uh, yeah i think i did that because i didn't want it to load all the stuff i mean the whole idea of having servers you don't have to load all the stuff on your own computer so i took whatever option out there didn't do that <laughs> so it's, it's pulling pictures from the server and uh yeah, it does real well for that because you can, once you get the slideshow going, you can set it for how many seconds you want to for it to stay on. You also set transition seconds, and so that works pretty well. And yeah, I mean, when times I've had it on, when the kids have come over, the grandkids, or or we have family dinner night every week, they seem to like watching the photos flash by. <laughs> yeah, <clears throat> we used to do that too. Put it on the TV and just have it sort of flip by um yeah i feel like we used to do a lot more with photos than we do anymore <laughs> and i don't know if that's yeah. burnout from having a kid and taking literally thousands of pictures for the first few years yeah. of her life and even that trailed way off like you know years <clears throat> zero through four and five there's like thousands of pictures per year and now she's 10 and it's kind of like <laughs> there were maybe 40 or 50 pictures last year i mean it's just you know, yeah. you stop taking pictures of everything all the time. At least I do. Yeah, uh, we actually just we actually just uh, got our pictures from 1990s film that we had, the old film in the box. Mm -hmm. We finally got it developed like recently. It's kind of expensive now, but but uh, but we got it developed, and a lot of it was dead stuff or stuff you couldn't really see that well. But yeah, so. We had that, and then we have all the pictures we've taken. But yeah, the uh, my wife tends to like to take pictures of the same person five times or six times in a row. I found out <laughs> by watching watching slideshows, like five or six pictures of one person. I thought, okay. <laughs> and some cameras, have... if you hold a button down too much, you know, uh, it's like. Yeah, uh, I have a few of those. You have to you have to turn you have to turn off that function sometimes off on the camera. Yeah, I yeah. took a picture of my wife who was sticking her tongue out one time in slow motion. <laughs> like that. I've I've learned though having taken a bad picture of a and not having had a good one, unfortunately, of a of an important occasion that I'll I'll take two now. So I'll usually do like yeah. two in a row. Just right. to, just in case that first one was blurry or something. But you know, yeah. so uh, smartphones have gotten, I mean, obviously one of the most important things on a smartphone anymore that one of the things you spend the most money for is the camera. Um, and they've gotten very good at like low light or, you know, f fast motion, like just they're good at being they're Basically I had that, that same little cameras I was talking about the last one I had, I realized that my smartphone was probably three or four times better <laughs> than that camera at some point. And I was just like, well, there's no point in carrying it around anymore because I already have my smartphone and, um, I used to think, you know, it, cameras have a larger lens, they have a larger 
uh, you know, sensor so that you could get better pictures off of them theoretically, but the processing on them is no, is nowhere near as good as it is on a smartphone. Now they put so much emphasis on, you know, co-processors for image, you know, handling that, uh, it's kind of hard to, to beat them honestly at this point. So, yeah, anyway. it's, uh, um, I think, well, uh, between, as you said, like when they were younger and then I was in scouting for eight plus years with my son, took a lot of pictures, a lot of nature pictures and stuff like that. And the last couple of years, um, I actually got tired of being the person out of the picture, you know, but, yeah. and, and everybody, I I'm, I'm in charge with every year making, uh, calendars for my, uh, my, uh, my stepmother-in-law, my father-in-law and, and that, and now the pictures are coming less and less. And my wife's like, well, reach out to my sisters about pictures and, you know, especially with their, <clears throat> they're, they're sending me pictures from their Apple iPhone, which they select the, the small one and they come out, you know, where I can't even put that on a calendar because of the uh, image size. Right. Thank you, Apple. But, um, <laughs> um, you know, uh, I, I want to get back. One of the things that I, I plan to do when I retire is maybe get out there more and, and, and get back into the photography. I'm not, again, great. I don't have a fantastic camera, but it's in the eye of the beholder. So what do you guys do to show off if show off your pictures? You, you know, we got all these pictures. Um, oh, what, what do we do? You know, I, I, I don't think, have uh, enough people around me to show them to to them and the ones that I do have around me, they have their own set. Okay. So this is what, um, you know, my wife hit that on me several years ago. She goes, you got all these digital pictures. You don't print them, hardly any of them. What, what good are they? You know, what, you know, what do you do with them? So, um, you know, and after her complaining too about all the laptops I had, you know, I took one of the laptops and it's now in, you know, in the family room showing family photos. So I, I, I created, instead of just all of them, I, I found a lot of them that, you know, stuff that we done with him and that. And my wife's like, oh, this is great. And, uh, and on the uh, laptop, I run variety wallpaper changer and I just have it change it every five minutes. And it works out great. Well, a variety is great for that. And the first night that she was able to win it, she goes, this was great, but I hate you because I stayed up to two o'clock in the morning looking at pictures that I had never seen before. <laughs> <laughs> so even even for yourself <clears throat> would would you do like you know you know and it's nice every once in a while i look up i go god i remember when i took that picture you know and i'll be the only one in the room it's not you know but then when family come over my sister my sister in law is like oh wow you got that all that oh wow where was that where, you know and, and all of a sudden they're watching the pictures as they change I think that's the thing. So pictures become more valuable as time goes on, in my opinion, uh, the immediacy. So I, I've tried to explain to my daughter the idea that, you know, film, film cameras, it was a roll of pictures. You had a certain number and generally you tried to take good pictures, right? Posed images or, you know, events like that. You didn't just have like hundreds of random pictures of nothing just because, right? Um, she's always had one of my old smartphones to be able to take all of the pictures she wants of whatever she wants. And so she does, she takes pictures of all of her flowers and her pets and everything else. And so it, the, the value of a photo is so much less now, in my opinion, because it used to be something that you put thought into, um, even if they were just a candid snapshot or, you know, just something quick that wasn't like high quality, it was still something that was of a, of a memory, you know? And so when you look back on those old photos, they tend to be better quality just simply because you had fewer shots available and you had to pay to have them, you know, uh, to have them, uh, Jesus, I don't even remember what it's called anymore. Developed. Uh, developed thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, you had, I mean, go to the photo hut or whatever it was and get them developed. And um, and now it's, I mean, it, I, apparently there is a, a resurgence in, you know, uh, old analog cameras and old film mm. that you can actually ship out uh, to have, but I mean, even Steve, I'm sure you've seen in your store. In, in fact, um, today is a good example. A lady found 23 rolls of film. I guess her husband had passed away 10 years ago. Uh, she had found 23 rolls of film and a couple of disposable cameras that 
she wanted to develop. She was sure that her kids are on them and, and all that. It is expensive. These We're talking because it, 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 it gets sent out. In most cases, it gets developed. It gets the negatives get scanned. They send it back to the store of origination for digital processing, and you get a CD out of it. You don't no longer have your um, negatives. The negatives, yeah. You know, for souls that like that, um, sending them out is not a great idea. Um, but the price wise, if she did all twenty three at once, and all say all the pictures came out because you get you get get charged for a certain amount for the developing and that, and then for each picture that comes out, it would have been in excess of four hundred dollars. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Disposable cameras now run about twenty seven ninety nine uh on average US <laughs> dollars. They yeah, should give so, you the camera for free. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, it is it is a chill. But people still find you know, like they find them. It's been if they've the negatives have been if the rolls of film have been kept in a relatively stable temperature environment, even after several years, they should come out. Yeah, that's yeah. that's a that's a challenge. But even with digital, so what I find is <clears throat> if I look back, you know, my daughter's 10, so I look back, you know, six, seven, eight years and see when she's a baby and then beyond that. So the value to me is not so much something that I took yesterday or today or whatever, other than sharing that maybe I saw an interesting car. <clears throat> Excuse me, my, my wife and I will do that. If I see a cool car, she sees a cool car, we'll take pictures and send them to each other stuff like that or you know whatever and, and it's all none of that is important it's nothing that i want to keep you know and look at again 10 years from now and be like oh yeah some random picture of a car um so th there, there's that sort of sharing you know taking a quick picture to sort of just share with someone and but then like i you know going back to having thousands of pictures it becomes overwhelming at a certain point even if you have a system that is in place that's going to automatically like the the value of something like Shotwell is that it's going to at least put it in dated folders by year and month and all that stuff and at least give you like Dan was saying some idea of like when something was taken so you could then sort of get a timeline and, and you know relate things that way and that, that's very helpful but if there's thousands of pictures it still doesn't solve the problem of it just being too much and um so anyway, I, I, <clears throat> I don't take pictures like I used to. And I also rely on technology a lot more than I used to, to do things for me when it comes to pictures uh, that, you know, I just don't think I would go. The idea of going back to where I was and managing all that myself, I, I don't think I would, honestly. To, to the point of, of the like large amount of photos that everybody takes nowadays, uh, I mean, because everybody's got smartphones on them, and it, the whole point of a smartphone nowadays almost seems to just be the camera. But um, th I mean, there have also been studies that show that like people who rely very heavily on taking photos of absolutely everything tend to have like worse or less detailed memories of those events. So constant reliance on, on tons of photos of everything around you means that you sort of, rather than creating those memories with the details you need, you just sort of link it. You know where to get those details rather than remembering the, the details themselves. So Right. Like knowing that you can search for some kind of fact on, on well, a search exactly. engine versus memorizing it. Yeah, yeah like, like uh, Shickle's talking about, I just had to help bury my aunt yesterday. Okay. Oh um she passed away we put her in the ground yesterday and a couple years ago i took pictures of her her granddaughter and all the family well they were all in good condition and now i have those memories you know to reflect on even though she's not alive anymore mm -hmm. right and that goes with some other relatives i have that are no longer around oh yeah yeah and that's that is the value right that is the so you know you have those things if you don't have a system to find them um like for better or for worse i know face recognition is not like a it can be used for things that are not uh in our best interest but at the same time it really makes it easy to find uh you know i used to use picasa back you know when that was a thing um and it had facial recognition and when that first came out it was like magic right because it was just like i have thousands of photos and I have a rough idea, like you're saying, Dan, like I have a rough idea when I saw this person last or saw them 10 years ago or whenever it was, but I can't, it, 
it would take me hours to search through all of these to find the picture I'm looking for. Facial recognition, all of a sudden, wow, you know, now I can literally find, you know, exactly what I'm looking for. Uh, the person, I'm, not just the person, but groups of people. You can say, uh, uh, you know, I want Jill and John and, and pictures of both of them together. And it's, it's, that was one of those fundamental shifts for me uh, in, in organizing and, and accessing photos, um, you know. It's crazy too, is that it, it can recognize you as you change over time. So like different hairstyles, different hair colors, uh, facial hair, glasses, uh, sometimes even masks it's it's shocking yeah what i find um funny is when people bring in um older we'll say like the um 60s era photo um not quite the polaroid but the old 126 camera you know era with um really bad color but when you look at them you go that looks like a picture that was in my family you know and they all kind of look the same but because of that era because of the way that 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 uh the, the camera captured the color and all that right but, but the hairdos and all that too also added to that i think we all have maybe pictures pictures like that that um remind everybody of of um of a certain time I'm framing it. Yeah, I got a picture from not more than like eight years ago and I had my deep purple tie dyed t shirt on and I was as thin as a twig. I weighed like <laughs> 170 pounds and I had a mustache. And I'm like, wow, I was that back then. And I had hair that went down to my shoulders. Yeah. I, that I, is the, that's, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I, Oh, I was just going to say, this is only sort of somewhat related to what you're saying, Steve, but those old photos, I don't know if people have been seeing the advertisements, but uh, AI, like they've been using AI a lot to clean up old photos. And apparently you can, there are services where you can take an old photo that's either in like poor condition or whatever, and, and whatever the AI does to sort of clean up, you know, spots and, mm -hmm. and you know, blemishes and the color and it's pretty amazing how it can do that. Yeah, I, I learned um, back in the day I had um, CS2 <clears throat> and uh, I was learning, I, I, one of these days I'll share some of the, if I can find them, the photo restorations that I've done. But I've also been learning to do it on GIMP. And it is pretty interesting when you can really get a, a, a photo cleaned up um, you know, uh, most drugs or retailer, you know, you go in and you can actually scan a photo and it actually gets sent off to a lab and they do it and I'm probably using Photoshop and that. And they send it back and we print it up and it's, you know, it's amazing um, how powerful some of those programs are. Um, you know, we can do it at home. It takes, it takes a lot of uh, um, looking at different programs or different ways to do it. And then if you're using, you know, Photoshop or using GIMP, but uh, I've used both and it's not quite professional, but I was always pleased with the outcome. It's like, it looked so much better than, than the original. Yeah. Well, if you have an well, old torn it, photo, don't get rid of it, save it. Yeah. Well, and I don't know, I think back to just thinking of photography and dealing like the idea that I always wanted a printer that could print a good photo. I can't even remember the last time I printed a photo. Um, I wanted a scanner that could scan a photo and also scan negatives because that was a, like, if you could get a negative and scan the negative, you could get an awesome, you know, high resolution, high resolution photo. Um, you know, just all of this stuff that was involved with dealing with photography. And yeah, I mean, it, it is for better, or for worse, you know, smartphones have pretty much destroyed all of that unless like you're saying steve where you're going to do uh some hobbies photography and get a dslr and like a real camera with a real lens and you know that kind of thing that that's the next step up i, I follow this one photographer in my old timer moment is keeping me from remembering his name i'll have to look <laughs> it up here and I'll, I'll have it in that chat i've been following him for a number of years and um quite a few years ago uh he was talking about the difference between at the time we're saying in the 20s 30s the box camera that big box camera they have 
then a 35 millimeter came out and that was thought of as you know like oh it's it's terrible but what had happened was world war ii came out and instead of on the field where these big box cameras were coming these guys were able to take these cameras you know uh what we would think would be bulky today was very uh, uh convenient and the and the war and and that really spurred 35 millimeter forward so he takes it to the future and the uh the, the smartphone you, you go to a party you whip out a big old camera and everybody like freezes you whip out one of these it's natural you're just snapping pictures and all that this became the new 35 millimeter camera and it was a very interesting um oh, ted forbes is his name there we go uh look up ted forbes um <clears throat> photography uh i i really like it he's very wordy and talks a lot but he's very good um but you know this changed the face of photography you know it looks like uh blackhawk <clears throat> 2029 in the chat is a is a photographer and he's been talking about doing his own uh developing of, uh, of pictures of film and uh, talking about scanning negatives and all that stuff so um yeah i i think I agree. So it is amazing how smartphones have really made taking pictures and organizing photos and sharing photos and all of the stuff that took a lot of work in the past um, seemed like, you know, it was it, it's just eliminated all of that. But at the same time, there is sort of a price to pay because they're not necessarily great pictures. Uh, they're really good for those candid shots. They're really good for, you know, selfies, for being in close, for taking a picture of a group of people. But I think for, for landscape, for like anything where you're trying to maybe do more with photography, it starts to get, you know, you, you, you run into limitations really quickly. And I've, I would love to get a mirrorless, one of those Sony mirrorless cameras. They look like they take amazing photos and, uh, you know, they get around a lot of the the inadequ inadequacies of DSLRs from, you know, from at least from what I've read about. And uh, so Steve, you know, maybe, I don't know if you, what, do you have a camera that's better than a smartphone or? Um, I have, and actually my son, I don't know if you can see it back here. He actually uses it. It's not a, um, uh, a uh, digital, uh, it's a digital camera. It's a, uh, a Canon uh, uh, SX40. Uh, and it's a bridge camera, what I think they call it a bridge camera. So it's a it's an all in one. It it uh, gets to forty the the forty they have an XX sixty now and all that, so the lens can go to forty times zoom. Um, gotcha. And that's what I use. Um, one of the other things that Ted Forbes and I don't know if Blackhawk would 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 agree with me. I mean, certain photographers are very, you know, uh, uh, you know, but not everybody can be a photographer, which is true. But photography like anything else is all um, in, in perspective. It's, it's, it's how you feel about it. And if you like the picture and no one else does, what does it matter? Right. But uh, also there's Tabs Forbes that said that, you know, uh, you know, these people go, Oh, if I had a better camera, if I had this, you know, uh, this and that I take better photos. Well, you learn to take pictures with what the camera that you have and what it can do. And, and that's how you go about it. And once, you know, you, you, you learn how a certain camera works, your eye gets better and things like that. I'm not a super great in, in any, any means in that, but I do think I have some nice pictures, at least to me, uh, that I've, I've, I've taken. Um, and it, it's just, it gets to be fun and you, it, and it's a great way to, to remember, uh, what, what you had done. What is cool about Canon's, and I think Dan, this might work for you. There is a hack. Uh, it's a uh, it's a, um, a firmware hack for Canons that you can use because they use the same processor on their high end cameras as they do on this one, but they lock this one down. And um, it's called oh check disk. I, no, I check this as um, check something. Anyway, you like do a firmware update and it opens up. The processor on this camera and i can now take this is not capable of taking raw pictures i can take rock pictures and yeah, you, the thing with this camera is is it's like 10 years old yeah there's still I'll, I'll have to send you the link it works on a lot of canons because in, in certain areas they use the same processor on a lot of canons. now it might have changed now in the last so many years 
but I've used it. I, it's on my SD card. If I want to take a raw picture, and you know, and Blackhawk will tell you that you know raw is the best way to go, and Wendy will tell you too. You know, and using the right pro, um, um, image processor, the program in that to use uh, will make a big difference on on your quality of your picture, because the processors on the camera crop the picture and color it and change it, and you're losing a lot of reference in that photo. Mm. But uh, it's it's pretty cool. It's um uh, I'll I'll have to look it up if no one else is. You know, for the it. most point I apart I use my phone if I when I'm need to take a picture because I don't have this camera with me most right. of the time. I use this camera for like the peppermint guys when they need a screenshot mm. and I can't use the screenshot tool. Uh -huh. This is really quick to load something yep. into it and then pipe it right into the computer to them. Yeah, Blackhawk says gear helps, but the most important piece of the equipment is between your ears. Yeah. If you're the amazing take... thing about this camera is, is it takes really good close-up pictures of, let's say you want to put a coin on eBay and prove that it's scratch-free. This camera will take that kind of picture where someone can look at it and back you up. But for distance, forget it. Yeah, I was going to say uh, with shot. Like magic lantern. Yeah, no, it's not. It's that's. Uh, I'll I'll look it up and I'll have it for you guys before I. Uh, for Magic Lantern here. is a, a custom firmware for cameras, also, even if it's not the same one you're thinking of. Uh, I'm going to take a, a minute out here, so I, if I look at the show notes, I'll see Eris's. You know, Eris might have problems, but we don't. So, uh, in, in in his uh, uh, poll that he did on the uh, um, Linux Saloon uh, Telegram group, how is Shotwell exploration going? 16% said Shotwell is amazing. It's picture perfect. Good one, Eris. 28% uh, said it's okay. 0% uh, actually said I'm not having a good time with it. 28% did say I'm not interested in trying it. 12% said I'm not able to, unable to do the exploration. 12% also said I'm not interested in doing the exploration. And 0 said other, you know, uh, please reply with other. And so, again, it's, it's a photo program. It's not for everybody, but it's a great organizer. I wanted to, it was, since poor Eris um, is mute tonight, so I wanted to do that. I think, uh, Steve, your your idea with the laptop and, and doing slideshows with the um, on screen is a great idea. And even shot while you can rate your pictures. Um, you can do simple rotating and enhancing of photos. Um, it's got toggle, uh, toggle switches for... Um, full screen and and uh, you know uh, selectors background and and it has all these simple um, things that you can do uh, with the photos. If I'm not to... mistaken, the shot well itself also has a slideshow feature that will run. Yes, yeah, it does. Uh, yeah, I thought I F5. had triggered that at one time. F five. F five. Yep, yeah. and uh, control. Control B will set the selected photo as background, which is uh, pretty handy. So uh, I think that could come in handy shot well itself just for displaying photos, like you said, Steve. It's not bad. Yeah, I mean, what's great with with Variety, and I'm finding that lately Variety is not kind of working on some things. Like I couldn't get it to work on um, Peppermint XSCE. I worked on Peppermint 10. I worked on... Um, Linux Lite, it's working on Linux uh, Zorin Lite, um, but something in Debian, it doesn't work right, right in um, uh, MX Linux either. I don't know if it's a Debian thing, it's a window cook, but Variety, you know, it's just a wallpaper changer. You can do a slideshow, but the wallpaper changer is great if you reboot your system. And I know you could probably maybe add uh, Shotwell to startup, but will it start up right away for slideshow? So if we have to, I have to reboot the family, the computer downstairs, it's going to come right up to Variety and it's going to start doing a paper chain. That's why I, for Variety, plus my wife likes the clock that shows on the screen that you can select in Variety. It makes her happy. That's what counts. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Definitely. And check disk is what uh, it's called. Uh, I put the link in uh, the, the, the YouTube chat. Um, and if you have a Canon camera, it, it, 
it's not invasive too so you won't and if you have a new camera or whatever it's under warranty because once you turn the camera off and back on it goes back to its regular firmware real cool hack i've done a lot of cool things with it um and that but you know as any photographer like raw pictures can take up a lot of space. they are heat but you can have fun with it and then, well, you know, it goes all the way back to 2009 so maybe it would work with this camera there's a yeah if you go i think there's a list of cameras that it will work on and you just add it to the your sd card in the camera and you go to your firmware update and select it and it unlocks the uh the uh, processor pretty cool raw is something that i'd like to play around with because it does <clears throat> it just seems like it solves so many of the problems i've had with trying to do post-production stuff on on images you know the, the fact that you can um I, I i can't think of specific examples at the moment but i i just know that raw itself it, yes it takes up a lot of room but there's when you save something down into jpeg format you're throwing away mm -hmm. so much of the image information and uh and raw just is is all of it you know and so you you have that ability to yeah. to uh yeah it's really uh in to to make changes in a way that is that are not permanent as well so you could actually go down the path of <clears throat> editing a photo and making a bunch of changes and then uh, yeah, getting for it back. Our, for our uh, average mortals, it's, you know, raw, you know, maybe with someone like Blackhawk or like Wendy and that it's, it's not going to use raw therapy or, uh, um, you know, if they're not using, if they're using, you know, uh, freeware raw therapy or um, I don't know if anybody uses uh, UFO anymore uh, or at all. Um, and that, a program I like to use a lot, or uh, did use a lot. I, I have it. Uh, it's called uh, Light Zone, uh, which is a very simple. It goes on by um, what's his name uh, a a a Adam Ansley, um, and Light Light Zone things. But it does read raw, and that and it's a uh, not a, it's relatively simple. Has a real nice photo organizer to it, and then most of your your, your raw therapy and a couple other th um, raw photo programs have good. Uh, software for uh organizing your photos and that's a big check because i know i'm i'm horrible you should see my obs setup it's just it, it's i tried to get it organized and it's like oh i got it all over the place again so then Shotwell as a photo organizing program sounds like and, and from what i've i just was playing around with it and you know i have maybe i don't know 50 or 100 pictures on my local hard drive not, certainly not as many as i used to but the ones that i have it found and it go it went ahead and did the uh, the dates and you know organized them and uh, and it did it all you know very minimal input from me uh so i mean i see that as being pretty valuable for someone that has a bunch of photos that aren't particularly organized in any way and you know that that would be a great way to be able to just sort of find what you're looking for uh stuff like sharing printing you know other things like that i haven't really taken a look at but i could see that if it, if it supports those uh things that that would be helpful as well um but i mean so in terms of a piece of software that that's you know built to do that it seems like it's pretty capable and i mean i didn't see anything weird with you know i didn't run any issues and into any issues myself and um i'm not a long long-term user but <clears throat> i could imagine that being helpful um you know to have and it's it's another one of those <clears throat> open pieces of open source software that seems like you know there's a nice amount of polish it's been around long enough it seems to work very well uh it seems like it's dependable that kind of thing so um yeah i, I think it's it seems like a worthwhile uh, you know, piece of software so anybody else on uh, shot well or on photography alone i mean you couldn't talk about shot well and not talk about photography. What would be the point, right? <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. Yeah, they kind of go together. Well, it does have a uh, crop and uh, enhanced image and eye remover and all the standard features you would have expect in a uh, a photo editor. But I think that's just part uh, a big part of the whole program that it's so nice across the board. It's pretty top notch. And it doesn't take a lot. I mean, you don't have to be an expert on it. It's a nice, simple program they have on your system, you know, and then if you, you know, you just need to do a quick crop, a quick, uh, you know, uh, adjustment. Um, 
send it off to the family or I'll post it on Facebook, uh, <laughs> um, Flickr. You know, I, I think it's uh, great and makes it nice and simple. And then you can use any other program for in-depth um, photography uh, adjustments. I'd be interested to know how someone could use it in a work in a professional workflow of having to track, you know, like jobs that you've done. That'd be interesting because the first thing that Shotwell does with all of my photos is organize them by date, which th makes me think that would be really easy way to. That was a really good tool for me. I found stuff that I thought was out of place and, you know, and it found the correct date when I was there and shot it. Well, and to your point, I think if you were <clears throat> using the import function where you'd be able to have it import into specific folders and you can predetermine the naming, you know, the st file structure and the naming and all that stuff like that would probably be hugely. I, I know that uh, what was the, the one that um, that Wendy's using photo rapid, download pro rapid photo downloader. Yeah. And that's why she uses it because it does make her life easier for mass importing all of that that those files and having it do uh, i think not only the naming and stuff but also potentially some resizing and different things as, I, I i don't know how she's using it but uh but i know that's one of the capabilities so so anything else other photo tips and tricks and hardware oh wait that's um <laughs> yeah i think maybe i could uh I was just doing a search on if you get up on Shotwell to do a slideshow automatically. Here was other interesting tidbit that uh, you can set desktop background or slideshow using Shotwell. Okay, I didn't yeah, look so at it, you know haven't looked at it that in depth. Um, yeah, according to this, you can open up file, set as desktop slideshow, and Shotwell will prompt you to for slideshow. Delay, which can be any interval up to one day in length. The background slideshow will proceed even when Shotwell is not running, it says, which might be convenient for if you don't want to use it, the whole kick and poodle of everything it's got mm -hmm. memory. It's simple, but I don't want to say it's. <laughs> so, another question that's kind of tangential to this is how do you guys go about? Um, well, I'll put it this way. I find myself deleting more photos than anything. When I, from, when I go to my phone, and I'm like, well, it's time to do a backup. Like next week, I've got a, I've got a phone coming in the mail. I'm going to take this phone and I'm going to back up everything to an external drive. And I'm going to go through and sort and throw out things because sometimes i just take pictures and stuff to document in case i need to have this or like you know you're at work and it's like all right there's some parts that are messed up i need to you know or i need to mm -hmm. take a picture of that super, send it to the supervisor or something like that you know that kind of stuff is still there so how do you guys kind of go about that backing up of things i actually kind of uh, work with that i actually create a different folder and the ones that I know that I'm not going to look at a lot, I usually call it archived pictures. And I, I put them in there and leave them in there for a very long time. And if I'm still not interested, then I'd consider deleting them. Yeah, I, unfortunately, yeah. I, I, I end up taking more pictures like at work or something. I, you know, um, so my uh, even though it's not a work, you know, it's my camera or my phone. You know, it's used for things that aren't for personal use, you know, and. You know, taking a picture of a display or things like that, something my boss is looking for, and I gotta send it off. And I don't always delete it. And you know, oh, you know, I catch some ire here, but you know, it's an Android phone, and I use Google Photos. Um, I'll delete things off my phone, but a lot, a lot of times it doesn't delete it off Google. But I go up there, and because I can now go on a computer and see everything in a bigger format, I can look at the pictures and easily delete quicker the ones that I I didn't want to say. Um, but it does hamper a little bit because sometimes I have to send it an email and I, I need to reduce the size of the photo. So then I reduce the size, you know, like the megapixel I think the camera does 12 and I have to change it down to four. So I can email it without problems to, you know, um, 
in in that aspect and that and those pictures are definitely not worth keeping you know four back is not bad but you know um, yeah i take I a lot um, of pictures of products that i i buy once you know and i'm not used to buying them and um i need to go buy a refill or something of it and i'll take a picture of the container so when i go in the store i remember which brand or what what i got before so i get the same thing again or i'm over at someone else's house they got a neat gadget like a a high-end toaster oven or something. Mm -hmm. I'll take a picture of it because I found it interesting and may want one. I think Scrap Jaw brings up a good point because when you're trying to back up your photos, you, you're actually, um, let's just say over a period of uh, three, four years, you do 10 backups. You, you're backing up um, certain photos 10 times. You know what I mean? Because um, you're going to be backing up everything that's on the SD card, obviously, right? So, yeah, it, I think it's a hard thing to manage. I think that's what Scrap Jaws uh, getting getting yeah, to. I think I don't even have. I've got. I've, usually, I plan out buying my phones and I buy them outright, unlocked, region locked, whatever, all that. And I don't have that luxury right now, so I had to go through Verizon and I'm getting a Pixel Six. And mm. there's no SD card on that, which is garbage. Because a lot of times I'll have more problems trying to transfer photos off of a phone when it's on the internal memory than on the SD card. Pop the SD card out, stick it in a reader in the USB on my laptop, and swoop, swap, done. But now it's, it's that. Plus, I know what you're saying. You'll have duplicates. I have a lot of duplicates of images sometimes because sometimes I'll change that SD card over, but I'll have backed it up and I'll have a folder that says that phone's name backup. And it won't just be the images. It'll be the downloads folder and everything. Mm -hmm. All of that goes right there. So yeah. that way I know it's there. I have all saved my contacts to a VCF or whatever the format is for full contacts. I'll save uh, whatever else my podcast list those things now this gets in a whole other topic of backing up your phone and changing phones but mainly the photos uh you know it gets a little bit weird like just, i just now like i was you know a lot of times i come in here and I'll, and I'll just run if we're running software i'll just go ahead and i'll install it at the beginning of the show and i'll just give you my dry run opinion of it and it took about 15 minutes to install to import a bunch of photos in place through usb on a external 120 gig ssd which is pretty good and there's a lot in there but it's only like from 2021 20, 2020 that's it and there's a lot of stuff in here i'm going to get rid of and a lot of the stuff i know is on my phone right now currently because this was a backup of that sd card at one point in time so it's going to be one of those things one of the things I noticed when I did this last import, in the end, at the end of the import, it gave a summary of all what it did. And it said it removed several, so many duplicate files, so much that. Didn't delete them, obviously, but it did, then it imported, it only imported one of each one photo in there. Nice. So that's, uh, that's cool. <laughs> I may have to play with this more. Yeah, it, it definitely helps to be more organized because you think sometimes, I mean, unless you're a real diehard, you think you're organized and then you find out that, oh, wait, I I, I was taking it. And I probably got to look at things differently, too. I could probably use um, tagging more than I do filing, but I like when I'm making my calendars for the family or things like that, I tend to do a copy and add it to another <clears> folder. <throat> So this is going to be my folder that I'm uh, either upload to the uh, um, you know drugstore website or something like that, wherever I'm going to print the calendar from, and then I end up not deleting it or leaving it, and I got all these double, triple pictures sitting all over because I'm doing it wrong, you know. Well, it's like a project folder at that point. Yeah, I was the same as you, Steve. I I wiped off my uh, my family photos twice. Um, um, installing Linux and also um, writing something to USB. I, I, all my family videos and photos deleted. And I used Test Disk, I think, and something else. 
had to buy something to actually get them all back. But going back through the photos, what a nightmare, right? I try, so I've got all my photos organised in folders and always have done. But just recently, I think today you can have photo saturation and you got, and you know, you, you take so many photos of things and it, you just look at it and think, oh, I just don't want to deal with it. <laughs> Um, but Anna Reed is saying in chat she does hers every month and deletes what she wants and and keeps what she deletes what she doesn't want and keeps what she wants. So um, I don't know. I couldn't do it every month. But that's the that's the you know the um, cool thing about digital. I mean, if you 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 know back mm. in the day, if you were spending money to buy a roll of film and then you spent money to. Um, process that yeah. film and spent money printing that those photos your worst photo you're gonna keep because you spent money on it and yeah. digital you can just and that's cool you know um you know some photos just aren't saying you know it's like yeah i don't know about you but sometimes i hit the wrong button or i'll the way that uh, the s8 is designed and the way i hold it i you know i used to like the screenshot when you used to like you know do the hand swipe now, if you do a uh, thumb on the power button and then the volume button, it takes a screenshot. Like I'm deleting a crap load of screenshots because of the way I hold my phone or you pick it up <laughs> and you, you know, it's like, you don't realize it and you got your finger on the snap button. Hey, you just loaded up your, your SD card with thousands of pictures that it's like, it can go really quick and deleting those can be a chore. Yeah. I have pictures of documents that I've taken pictures of. And all sorts of stuff like that, car VIN numbers, things like that. <laughs> and I know that I need to go back through and clean my photos because of that. Uh, Blackhawk says, Prince, 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 people don't print anymore and it's awful. I lost quite a bit of stuff to a drive failure a few years ago and backed it up yet. I have prints made of everything important. I have a, a, a lady that every few weeks, and she, I don't know what if she's ordering them for family or if she's organizing in her head, but she, they'll, it'll be up to a hundred photos, and she'll do like six orders um, of different pictures. I don't know, maybe she might be sending the same ones and giving them off to people. There are people that still print their digital, and it's you know they're, they're putting them in album like that instead of doing what maybe most of us would do a slideshow and that. And there's something something about. It's like reading a book. There's something about the physicality of looking through a photo album. You know, uh, you know, uh, it's a lot more personal, maybe, to me, um, and tactile. And you're going through that photo album and you're looking at it and the memories come up instead of watching it on a screen. It's a lot. It's kind of a lost art for most. Remember the way we used to do. Remember the way we used to do slides back in the day. Like they used to be in the square things, and and yeah. you would uh, you know go through them and have a family uh, show, uh, photo night or something, and yeah. go through. <laughs> but but uh, getting back to your point, um, when you had to buy a roll of film and develop it, you were very careful with the photos that you took, right? Um, but these days we can just snap photos whenever we like and um, just, to, you know, things that really of no importance and, and it can just uh, be hard to deal with because there's so many photos to delete probably because they don't mean I mean, anything. how many have taken photos and, and, you know, and whether they're digital or printed and you like go, I know there was a reason I, I took this photo but now I have no freaking idea why I took this <laughs> photo, you know, and it's like, yeah. Or when photos yeah. get downloaded from uh, strange <clears throat> advertising sites, things like that. And then you, you're going, what, what is this here for? Have you like that? I have to say though, shot well, um, the way it organizes everything, it, it makes it easier to sort of see what's what, what year, what month, um, which is pretty handy. So you can sort of organise your pictures a bit better, even if they're not in folders. You, you probably know where they come from, what year they were taken, what month they were taken. I think even dates, I think it has 
on here. It's got the dates as well. It's got, um, uh, what is it? Basic information, also extended information. So that's, that's handy. So you could probably, you know, um, just move photos into certain folders within the Shopwell um, application to sort your photos out. So I might yeah. even try that actually. Yeah. You know, and, then, and then, um, you know, we, we've talked, you're talking about the backup and I started mentioning, I, you know, I, I just use Google photos, say good, bad about it. <clears throat> um, my recent hard drive backup drive debacle was when I was crying. Uh, I had just switched over to, to pop and I had backed up all the stuff from my pre, you know, I think it was, you know, it was Peppermint 10. And I started using pop as uh, the, as my main um, system and that. And I, I, I pulled all my music up first, the important stuff. And I feel like I have time to get the photos. Well, I was trying that um, uh, Ventoy and uh, brilliant guy here couldn't read the difference between a, you know, a USB and the hard drive. <laughs> and I saw Ventoy on the hard drive. Now I've used successfully, it took me a couple of tries, but I've used successfully test this and photo rack to recover. You know? uh, and so I was doing a multiple of backup. It turns out my, my backup backup drive is messed up. I can't even boot into it. All the stuff Ventoy, you know, wipe, wipe, the whole gigabyte, one one and a half gigabyte drive, out, and photo rec is coming up with a bunch of errors trying to get it. Now I had read where Ventoy kind of overwrites something at the beginning of a USB, and it might have done it on the on the uh, hard drive, so I can't get it. So F Google Photos has actually been a downside. Now I I I don't have thousands of thousands. I got quite I got. Probably when it comes down to it, um, it's still under, you know, I got what to get the 15 gig limit on, on uh, uh, Google uh, Photos. It's been, a, it's been, I guess, a godsend to me because now all those photos are still there. And because I don't, my camera never took more than 12 megapixel photos, they're, they're still a full res size. And I'm slowly starting to draw, pull those back down, but they're all in order. And I'll look at it and I like, what year was that when I and I, I'm always off the the years, like when we went on trips and that. Me I, too. And and that's you know, but you know, you know, backup, backup, backup. I I had a backup of my backup, and then my backup drive went, and I messed <laughs> up a backup drive. Like, and I tried using Photo Rec, and it, it will not find those photos. And that you know, it's like, and I I I, I was gonna reach out and um, be a professional. Um, there was someone in the, in the area, I, I did a search and all that, but it could cost several hundred dollars for them to use their professional stuff to get your photos back. It's like a, a, a um, you know, we gotcha. Yeah. Um, and I'm like, um, nah, okay. I won't do yeah. That. Distro hopping has helped me out in that regard because oh. I, I, my wife never knows when she goes to open the laptop, what, distro is going to be on it <laughs> so <laughs> so anyway i have this system i back up all my photos onto well i have a drive in the framework and a drive in the uh the laptop over here that i back up everything to then i have this sd card to back up everything to plus i have all my pictures mostly on most of my computers in here so i have to pretty much have the hurricane come through here to wipe out all my pictures <laughs> So I'm the same as you, Steve. I've got, I cherry pick certain photos and upload them to Google, Google drive. Um, that's just a, another absolute backup. It's not everything, but it's uh, just photos that you would cherish for the family. That's it. Yeah. Just in case some disaster happens. I think mm -hmm. I might even have some on, um, what's the other one? Hotmail, I think may have some on there as well, just in case, but you never know. Um, just in case an absolute disaster happens, I've got mm. them there. So that always comes in handy, I believe. 
it just occurred to me that I, before sites like Flickr and Google Photos and like ways to have your photos online, <clears throat> for my family, I had set up a shared uh, web portal where you were able to upload files, you know, images and create like some of the rudimentary fun <clears throat> functionality of modern uh, photo management software. And it was all web-based and like for, uh, for about five years or so, that was like our preferred way of, as a family, like my family in Pennsylvania and elsewhere, like um, it was a way for us to, to share uh, photos digitally without, you know, emailing them and, you know, goofy stuff like that. So, um, so yeah, I mean, the idea of all of the effort I used to put into managing photos and, and now I, <laughs> I don't even think about it. Yeah. It's, it is. Yeah. I, I see, you know, people constantly come in and i especially their iPhone 5,000 photos. <laughs> And then, and then I don't know. So I don't know much about the uh, the iPhone, but then uh, the iCloud, because uh, the the iPhone starts getting filled up, iCloud will turn on. I think at a certain point and upload everything. Now they'll still be able to see it on their phone as it's on their phone, but if they come to um, you know like uh, a retail place to have it, we can't read the iCloud, and they get really mad when they can't find their photos. They're here. I know they're here. They're right here. Right here. You got to remember the cloud is somebody else's computer. Right. Mm -hmm. But I, I, you know, um, I've had this discussion with like Adam and a couple other people about, you know, uh, iPhones and that. At least with this, if I have Google Photos on it, I can download one, two pictures at a time. Can't do that. Uh, unless you sign in and use your ID and all that. But what these people do is they'll do a screenshot. So they'll do a screenshot of a photo of a photo. And that's their <laughs> get around. Well, you know, my iPhone, I don't need to use the cloud. I don't use their cloud services at all. All I do is plug the iPhone Thunderbolt cable into the phone and plug it into my computer. And Linux will recognize the photo folder. You can unload all your photos right off your phone. That's the only thing you can do without iTunes. I don't think he, I, I I think um you don't really need I well, maybe your old phone <laughs> but from what I gather iTunes is not really a part of loading and loading things back onto the phone like it, it is like for that. apps and stuff like that and backing up your phone if you don't want to back it up on the cloud Again that's where I'm ignorant I'm not a and iTunes is mostly geared for Windows I think uh, Apple has their own stuff that's a little better all right. Well, any other things on photography and what we'll move on to? I don't have a list here. Um, any news this week in Linux? Well, just so you know, the um, uh, thanks, Jinder, for reminding me. Uh, I had to look it up on YouTube as well, but I was looking at Storm OS and the new utilities program that Storm OS had. I had Titan yes. Linux stuck in my head because they're all um, some of the same guys working on this stuff. Um, and when you asked me, I just couldn't think of what the, that was. <laughs> You're still young, so, dude. Don't yeah. be like me. Come on. I'm the old guy. Here. Um, you need to take a look at Titan OS. Download a copy and do a video on it. Um, I'm in the middle of doing, that. I'm in the middle of doing a video because Cobalt Rogue actually uh, contacted me on YouTube chat. So, yeah, I'm in the middle of doing a video okay. for um, Titan I, Linux uh, because I'm subscribed to Matthew Moore, have been for many years. Um, I uh, talked to them very, directly. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, it uh, looks quite neat, little Apple um, distro, actually. So, yeah, I think yeah. Matthew said, uh, mm. if you watch his video, um, it's a light KDE, but the ISO is still like about 2.3 gigs. Um, but it's a Debian base, but they, um, I think added a lot of, uh, what maybe one would call hardware enablement, you know, a lot of modern, you know, so it can run better on more modern hardware through Deb, you know, with Debian, um, which put it this way with Bluetooth, you don't even have to install the Bluetooth drivers. They come installed with KDE. 
I was really um, surprised. I I actually went to the enable Bluetooth tool or I don't even think I did that. I just um, clicked on the icon, put on my JBL headphones and like, wow, it hooked right up to them. What I find interesting is they've got a thing called Titan Toolbox Mm -hmm. and it has a lot of good stuff in there for new users, especially to, you know, install codecs and, and, and do all these simple tasks that would be, you know, a terminal grinding process that people would have to go through in uh, in Debian, which they've taken away all that uh, hard work for a new user. Of course, seasoned users would just find it easy to do, um, even with their the, the tools that they provide um, for a quick setup. But yeah, their KDE is very slim. Um, applications are very slim. Um, they don't have much in there. And it seems to be reasonably snappy in a VM. So um, it's quite an interesting project. And you still got the full functionality of the KDE desktop, but they just let you as a user, you know, sort out what you want to do with it, which is, uh, which is what I like. So you, there's, there's only a very bare minimum of applications in there. So, and I think, I think that's a good start for people so they can build their own distro in a very easy way. So Interesting it's a, project. It, it's an easy gateway for somebody to learn about KDE and get into it. I usually struggle with KDE. This distro, I had less issues struggling with it. Any particular reason why? I don't know. I just don't click with the way it works, especially with Dolphin and uh, you know, and the Discover Software Center and how certain things work in it. I'm the same. I, KDE for me, like in uh, at the moment in a virtual machine, I can't get the shared folder to work. Now that normally for me on any other, um, what can you say, GTK desktop or whatever, GNOME, XFCE, whatever, shared folders just works out of the box with most of the time with one simple command in the guest OS. KDE, it's not working. And I don't use KDE enough to figure out why it's not working. And I think there's certain things that Dolphin and KDE do that I, because I don't use it enough, I don't dig into it enough. And and I think if you've used GTK desktops long enough, you sort of know the, the little perks of how to get things going. But uh, KDE can be a lot different to other things. That's what I find. I don't it's dislike the, it. It's the it's yin to the much. yang. <laughs> yeah. It's just lack of knowledge, I think, is the problem. And I just, I don't know. It's just, I think I've, I was, as a Linux user, I was always in the GTK realm. And, I, you know, I know all the applications and I know where folders are kept and all that sort of thing. So I think I just sort of stick to that side of things. Yeah, KDE has a weird thing with um, share folders. If they're in, depending on where they're at inside, I think, in your uh, in your home directory, there's permission issues. They'll show up on the network, but you won't be able to get into them, or you won't be able to share them. It's like it protects things a little different, and I right. haven't quite got around to figuring out how it does. I always got around it by just putting a folder like somewhere on the root and just making that a share there. Right. I just went through, I just went via my um, network drive instead, but it's just always handy to have the shared folder work and so you can just quickly st- uh, throw things in the shared folder instead of having to log on to your network drive and stuff. But I did it that way because that worked okay. There was no problems there, but uh, the shared folder is just a little bit more handy. But yeah, it, it is what it is. It's my lack of knowledge and it's KDE works different to other things. So that, that's basically what it comes down to at the end of the day. Yeah, I'm just a gnome guy. <laughs> just a gnome guy. Well, you know, we have we there's a lot of people out there that really bash gnome and stuff like that, but they don't take they don't stop and take in consideration for a moment. Gnome makes a lot of other really good stuff that we get for free also. Now, even if you don't like their desktop, they make a lot of good applications and don't ask hardly anything for them. 
Uh oh, we tar- started talking about KDE. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh. <laughs> we should have been talking about XFC. We had Brian. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Michael. I heard it. It just somehow, I don't know, it just happened. So I had to join. And, you know, so what about KDE? It's amazing. Agreed. All right. Mm-hmm. We're done here. All right. Bye. All right, cool. <laughs> oh, God. You guys cracked me up. Mm, those share folders. KDE is fantastic. All the things that people are hearing about the, the negatives uh, might be true, but also they're not at the same time. Okay. It's like everything. Then tell else, us right? how to get the share folders to work. I get shared turtles all the work all the time. What do you mean? <laughs> what distro this is this anyway? Um, it was uh Titan Linux based. Well, you could basically say it's Debian based uh, KDE. There you go. That's why. Hundred percent. All the other Debian based distros, I can get the shared folder to work. It works great with Pepper. Debian. Debian is okay. This is going to be, I'll just put it out there. Debian's the worst distro base for KDE, unless it is Kubuntu or something using Kubuntu, because it is super, super old. The whole thing about KDE is that it's constantly moving and getting better and better. But Debian doesn't do that. So if you look at the current version of what's in Debian, it is four or five versions out of date. And that's many, many years out of date. And there's a new version of, of Plasma coming out in just like a month and a half. And it's not going to be in Debian ever because by the time the new version of Plasma gets into Debian, we're looking at like a year and a half from now at best. So when, when the people have issues with Plasma in Debian, I would be like, well, it's because it's Debian. And if you want the latest version of Plasma, you can't use Debian. That's why when people say, I want to use MX Linux, like that's great but not the plasma version because it's kind of old. And that's just the, the, that's just how the cookie crumbles as they say. Yeah. Well, it's, it's the same with, uh, with, with gnome. So I, I've been, I did a, uh, a test. I've never done this before. I, people always talk about it, but I took the peppermint base and I added uh, Debian testing to it to get gnome 42. It was a, it's a trial. It's a challenge, but it was fun. And, Headache at the same time, but yeah. you are exactly right. It would, it's I think in in uh, Gnome alone in Debian stable is three three thirty eight. Yeah, yeah. You yeah, know, I, you... I have to. I have to agree. Um, you know, it takes a long time to figure out w- when you're within Linux. Um, Debian is a very popular um, distro, I believe. Um, you do a video on Debian, it gets a lot of views, but. Um, I think it's the stability thing that, that people are attracted to. But, um, yeah, it, and, and until you try it, really. yeah, I think so. And, and, and until you try Debian and you realise how far out of date packages are, um, it's one of those things that um, if you're happy with what it supplies, then that's fine. But um, and, and also as far as applications and desktops concerned. But if you're chasing... The, uh, the new and up-to-date things, yeah, you're going to be pretty much out of luck. It just depends, I think, on the user, I, I believe, whether you're happy with the older stuff or not. We've yeah. been talking about, you know, with modern package formats, the, especially the universal package formats and the access to modern software, no matter what distro you're on, you know, with things like snaps and flatbacks and app images. Um, <clears throat> this is definitely one of those issues that still is relevant when you're talking about which distro, distro to run. You know, if you are in Debian, then yeah, you just have to be okay with, with older versions of, and you could get around an older version of Shotwell, right? Because you can get the flat pack version of it, but you're still going to be on the old version of KDE or the old version of, you know, GNOME or whatever. That's correct. Yeah. So you, you, you kind of have to, I mean, I guess if you're okay with the older version of the desktop environment and just want a new, newer version of a piece of software, then that, that works. But yeah, yeah. I mean, if you, if you're, you know, I agree with Michael, like they, there are so many improvements being made in plasma in in all desktop environments as they're moving forward. I mean, these aren't like small incremental changes. These are like huge leaps forward. 
So if mm-hmm. you're running something that's like years old, I mean, that's that's so far beyond. And I get that it's still technically long-term support or stable or whatever, but I mean, capability-wise, it's just so far beyond. You know, back. <laughs> it's like well, wow, that's Buzz right. Is not even long-term support in Debian. Like the le- yeah. long-term support is fi- is five twenty-four, I think. Yeah. Five twenty-four. Well, yeah. hasn't there been so it- <laughs> talk about? Uh, and, and haven't you guys talked about it, Michael? Uh, uh, Debian. There's been a struggle. Debian has been looking at maybe moving forward a little bit quicker. Not no, unfortunately, no. that applies to a few things that are just critical. Like for example, a, a desktop environment is not a critical thing that mm-hmm. needs to move all the time, but a web browser is. So they are putting more effort into pushing those the web browsers much faster. They were mm-hmm. like, but not really. So they're making sure to keep up to date with the ESR builds, but that's it. So like ESR or whatever. Chrome calls it, is the long-term support versions of those things. And they are willing to keep those up to date, but not keep up to date with like the latest version of Firefox and that sort of stuff, which I kind of get because Debian is known for being, you know, the not updating that much and trying to keep up with Firefox every four to six weeks. That'd be difficult. So I get why they couldn't do that. Um, but that's pretty much all they're doing is turn, it, they're keeping updates with security maintenance and that and the browsers, the ESR versions of the browsers, which is it, fair enough. That's what they want to do. So I, it's not like a anti Debian thing when I brought up the whole is super old. It's more of like if someone has an issue with Plasma on Debian, it's an it's a it's an, a problem that can't be solved by any update because you're not going to get it. And that's why I always try to guide people away from Debian who want to use Plasma. If you want to use Window Maker, you're going to love Pla- you're going to love Debian. It's going to be fantastic. If you want to use Openbox, you're going to love Debian. No problem. But if you want to use anything that's up to date, GNOME, Plasma, Cinnamon, which I'm not sure you can even get inside of Debian, you still Yeah, I got it. Good, but yeah, uh, but things like that, hmm. you're not going to get the latest version. And if you run into a bug, you're stuck with that bug no matter what. And unless you update Debian, which then defeats the point of having Debian, you might as well just use something else, even Ubuntu or uh, something based on Ubuntu or Fedora or OpenSUSE. All of those are going to be a better experience in the case of those kinds of DEs. Like when I look at GNOME, the Debian version of GNOME, I, I don't want to use that thing. But the latest versions of GNOME, they're pretty sick. I like them. Mm. So, you know, if I can use the no, latest GNOME 42, I think it's I think it's a really good DE. But you can't get that in Debian without going through like a headache. I think so, um, the best the best desktop choice for, for Debian would be XFCE. because so I think they're on the latest for that, I'm pretty sure. Um, and then if you use flat packs and snaps or app images, mm-hmm. yeah, for now, yeah. Um, but XFCE doesn't change a heck of a lot anyway, so it's not too bad. Well, I think they, um, they're, the progress is a little bit quicker. Um, it has been of late, yeah, I must say. Yeah, they're trying to do it. Um, they were they they announced they're going to try to do it once a year, but it's more like around once every two years now. Um, so that's still a big update from every four years. So. Uh, that's mm. you know De- at some point Debian is going to be not even a good option for that one too. Eventually, it's just the thing about Debian is there is this thing that is constantly touted about them as being like this is the stable distro, but people don't pay attention to what that word means because it doesn't mean what you think it means in terms of like the entire like the ecosystem the community mm-hmm. refers to that word as to build as stability, but that word does not mean stable in programming. It means not moving, unchanging. That's it. That's why Debian is stable because it don't change. And that's it. That's why that's why I hate that word used for any kind of software, but it's the most commonly used word when you're talking about a like a final release. It's this is the stable release, and it could be an application or a distro or whatever, but that word never means what people 
think it means that are using the application or the system. Like that's why I prefer like Gecko Linux uses the term static, which is what they should be using because that's very, much more clear of what it means. Yeah. And so then... when it comes to, go ahead. sorry, Steve. No, go ahead, Carl. I was going to say when it comes to Debian, I'd have to think that um, putting applications and desktops aside, that the guts of it would have to be um, stable enough for Ubuntu to base everything on. Wouldn't it be like it gets all its apt and dead Personally, packages? I don't, I don't agree. No. You don't um, agree? Okay. No, because um, Ubuntu uses Debian testing most of the time. And oh, do they? Oh, Debian oh they use right. Okay. Yeah, so they're they're moving along with Debian faster than Debian, and also in many ways, Ubuntu is working on Debian. Like a lot of people aren't aware of how many people or are in development parts of Debian are employees of Canonical. Like the oh, person who manages apt, the package manager for Debian is a Canonical employee. So right. there are tons of different things that they're doing to make it move faster so that on the testing and testing slash unstable version that, cannot, that Ubuntu can use that stuff too. So I think that you could say Debian's a good foundational distro, but the stable release of Debian is not really a practical use for most people. I mean, if you are fine with the existing tools that you want to use and you like those older window manager type stuff, then Debian's going to be a great experience. And I've, I know a lot of people who use it and prefer it because you can get it on all sorts of different um, platforms and stuff and there is the value to that but if you're looking for any kind of modern experience that's just not going to be Debian. yeah you have to remember those are servers it's basically a server software for the most part oh, i wouldn't even put Debian on a server i've got it on my server Debian is a is a is a, i would re i would recommend people use ubuntu instead of Debian on a server because really? Debian has a lot of stuff that by default are not server friendly and should not be by default. Like for example, Ubuntu and most distributions have some kind of security mechanism that's like fail to ban when someone tries to remotely connect to it. Debian does not. Debian's a fail to open, which means yeah. it fails and lets you in. That's bad. Yeah, the last I heard, I guess, or read that it's the most popular server distro. Ubuntu is, is more popular than Debian by far. Well, they were for about a year, I think, back in the day, but at least this article I read, I don't know how accurate it is, but it did say that Debian was took back over the number one spot. I guess it's possible. I don't know. I mean, Debian, the reason I have a problem with Debian is because their, their default settings are not made. They're, they're made more for a take this and mold it to what you want. And that's kind of how Arch is. Take it and mold it how you want. It's a different approach to the concept, but it's still like a molding factor. And that's great for people who want to do that part, that part that process. But if someone just wants to take a server distribution and throw it up and let it go, uh, Debian's not going to be that thing because you need to do a few hardening and setup things to get that to be good. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you like did CentOS, you have SE Linux out of the box. Or if you use Ubuntu, you have App Armor out of the box. That mm -hmm. sort of stuff. Adam, what do you say, server guy? <laughs> I'm sorry, what? <laughs> uh, <laughs> that conversation kind of quickly went to, to about yeah. servers and that. Um, I know I know your opinion on, on Debian, but uh, yeah, it's, Ubuntu yeah. as a server? Uh, yeah, Ubuntu as a server is great. We All of our servers at work are Ubuntu. All of our Linux servers, at least. Yeah, then, I mean, Ubuntu is solid for a server. The LDS ones, at least. I don't, I don't know that I'd run an interim one, but yeah, mostly that's yeah. a ISV support thing. Yeah. If I was are, we picking a distro, are we picking a distro for next week or something? No. Or? So um, I, I this was a, a, a great discussion. It's probably a good discussion for another night. Uh, it could go yeah, long for and, sure. And hard. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Michael, <laughs> for uh, your views. And thank you, Adam, for chiming in. Um, so yeah, we're we're at our two hour mark, uh, minus some of the 
silence at the beginning. Uh, next week, I believe, uh, thank you to Eris, uh, we're doing um, News Flight, um, which nice. will probably steal stuff from Michael again. <laughs> And uh, that is that is the benefit of being on the network. It yes. is it is provided uh, at, right before the show even starts. But we'll do it. Um, uh, how dare you? <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, uh, I want to thank everybody. Uh, I, I, I think the discussion went really good. I, I was a little worried there about uh, uh, um, Chatwell. Has been a discussion for a long time, but we did it good. We added photo photography to it, and you can't talk about that well without talking about photography. So that was pretty cool. So next week, that I guess. That was also uh, a fantastic thing that helped uh, fight some patent trolls. Yes, that's right. We didn't bring that up. Yes, they, there was a real good thing about that. So a uh, news flight for next week. Um, so uh, I want to kind of wrap it up. Uh, uh, we'll talk about uh, some stuff to plug. We'll start with uh, Rick. You're not your Linux guru guy. What are we doing this week, Rick? Well, I was interested in Titan looking at, since y'all were talking about it, might just do that or open source or something along those lines. Okay. Uh, Mark's not here tonight, um, but he's got his Atlanta Linux user group. Uh, he meets... They meet at three o'clock Eastern on Sun is it Sundays or Wednesday? Sunday. Sundays. So uh, I don't have a link for that. If someone you know happens to have that link, if you can post it, if you like Linux user groups, um, the destination Linux. Are you guys streaming tomorrow with Mother's Day or? We are. We are. Oh. Um, <laughs> very very cool any any uh uh there's another there's a reason why we're doing it tomorrow okay. and we'll uh we'll we'll save it for the show all right uh the reminder that Linux user space are on a break i think well deserved um lennox out loud um i think this is behind i don't know what they're talking about nate was unable to jump on um they have what makes a good beginner friendly distro but i think they did that the other week so this is a little behind here and always you can catch stuff at cubiclenate.com on his doodling at, and actually i am going to do something tomorrow morning too i was going to i offered to my wife to take it off and she's like you know um no i don't want to sleep late so uh hopefully i can still make her <laughs> breakfast and that um but i I think I might just be going over a little bit of uh, Ubuntu Unity because I never looked at Unity before. And uh, it's, uh, I'll just say, interesting right now. Um, but, I like uh, Unity. It, uh, it will be one of my topics of discussion for tomorrow morning. I still have yet to post that stuff. So uh, I want to, uh, from Nate, I want to thank all of you for being a part of the conversation in both the Zoom meeting and the YouTube stream, as well as everyone for watching the show after the fact. And I want to apologize I, real hard. You know, it's one thing I'm on my show by myself. I can keep an eye on the chat and I've missed a lot. There are a lot of great discussions out there. Uh, so uh, keep that going. Uh, I also want to thank everyone involved in making the Linux and open source tools possible for us, not only to have this conversation, also to have fun and enjoy our technology. Linux timely, truly, Linux truly puts the personal back into personal computers. And thank you for stopping by to make sure you tip your developers and please remember to Linux responsibly next time. We'll see you guys. Thanks for stopping by. Later. Have a good day. Later, everybody. Happy Mother's Day to all you mothers mm -hmm. uh, and uh, to all you single fathers too. So have a good day. Bye. Bye.